Hi and welcome to this class on the last five chapters of the book of Romans. I was trying to decide what in-depth Bible study to do uh, for this quarter and uh, for a combination of reasons I kind of realized that I'm, I delve into the first part of the book of Romans quite often. I am uh, regularly in chapter 3 and chapter 5 and definitely in chapter 8 and it dawned on me that normally that's where I that's where I live when I look at the book of Romans uh, the first the first eight chapters or so particularly and so I thought it would be really neat to pick up where Paul kind of shifts gears in the book of Romans and and changes into more of a practical application of the theology that he has presented although you would have to say that chapter 8 is one of the most practical chapters in all of scripture but still he kind of shifts gears in chapter 12 and takes everything that he's been talking about before that and uh, lays out for us uh, good living lays out for us how we apply that life of the spirit in chapter 8 and the fact that God is righteous and has saved us and has given us hope uh, in all those chapters leading up to this point. And then he moves forward and shows how we can make that uh, real in our lives. I do want to kind of think about the previous chapters of Romans as we start this study and note the theme. And I'm going to read a few of the notes out of the ESV uh, study Bible. but. Uh, almost everyone considers Romans 1, verses 16 and 17, the theme of the whole book. Paul writes, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. And here are a few comments that the ESV study Bible writers uh, give us concerning this. They do call these two verses the theme and they write, Paul explains why he is so eager to preach the gospel everywhere. The gospel is the saving power of God in which the righteousness of God is revealed. Considering verse 16 particularly, because of their lack of size, fame, and honor in the Roman corridors of power and influence, Christians might be tempted to be ashamed of the Christian message, but Paul says it has nothing to be ashamed of, for it is in fact a message coming with the power of God that brings people to salvation. Jew first indicates the priority of the Jews in salvation history and their election as God's people. And I'll add, obviously, it also extends the idea that we're given in, in the book of Acts, where the gospel was to start in Jerusalem, spread to Samaria, and then to the ends of the earth. Uh, the role of the Jews is a major issue in Romans, as seen especially in the discussions in chapters 9 through 11, the ones preceding what we'll be studying this quarter. Greek is not limited here to the people from Greece, but of course it refers to all Gentiles. And then I really like the note on verse 17. A crucial phrase, the righteousness of God that has been the subject of intense debate. It most likely means primarily righteousness from God so that it denotes right standing before God, a legal reality that is given to people by God. A similar expression in Greek clearly has this meaning in uh, Philippians 3.9. Romans 10.5 is parallel to Philippians 3.9 and bears the same meaning. It is likely that the phrase bears this meaning as well in Romans 3 verses 21 and 22 and in 2 Corinthians 5.21. However, the expression in the Greek likely also carries an additional fuller meaning which refers directly to God's right moral character, particularly manifested in His holiness and justice, and in the way that His method of saving sinners through Christ's death meets the just demand of His holy nature. Although today's Western world often regards using words that carry a double sense as confusing and ambiguous, in New Testament times, such wording was commonly used to add weight and enrichment. From faith for faith probably means that right standing with God is by faith from start to finish. The life of faith is all-encompassing. It is by faith that one initially receives the gift of salvation, but it is also by faith that one lives each day. And that's kind of where 
we're going to pick up in chapters 12 to 16. I'm excited about our study. We're going to only look at two verses uh, this evening, and then we'll do between 5 and 15 verses most of these weeks to get through chapters 12 uh, through uh, 16. And we'll do all of 16 as it's kind of a, a summary, some greetings, some things that won't require uh, so much of us delving into them as some of the other passages. So really we'll do 12 through 15, those four chapters in 12 weeks, and then we'll do chapter 16 at the end. So tonight, present your bodies as a living sacrifice. Romans 12 verses 1 and two. So let's go ahead and, and dive right in uh, to our text for this evening. Uh, Romans 1, we'll, we'll just kind of go phrase by phrase uh, with this lesson, and then as we have more verses, we might go in different directions. But for tonight, that's what we'll do. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. This idea of appealing or beseeching is something very, very common with the Apostle Paul. And he uh, has used language such as this in many other places. 2 Corinthians 10, 1 and 2. I, Paul, myself, entreat you, and notice it's here, by the meekness and gentleness of Christ. I, who am humble when face to face with you, but bold toward you when I'm away. I beg, so he entreats, that's how the word is translated at the beginning of verse 1, and then in verse 2, I beg of you that when I'm present, I may not have to show boldness with such confidence as I count on showing against some who suspect us of walking according to the flesh. Um, I can't imagine people claiming that Paul would be walking by the flesh. Just a little side note. Uh, his Even before he came to Christ, he was diligent in striving to do what God wanted him to do. Uh, he talks about being in good conscience the whole time. He thought he was doing the right things. And so hard to imagine people making that claim against him. But the point here is that he entreats, he begs, he persuades. And I don't think we should be afraid of uh, doing a little entreating or beseeching or begging ourselves. I mean, if we really want people to go to heaven, uh, we're going to want to be as bold as we possible, possibly can. We never want to be ashamed of the gospel of Christ. And, and we want to do whatever we can uh, to move the message of Christ along, to help uh, to be Christ's ambassadors uh, in this life. Uh, similar language in Philemon, verses 8 through 10. Accordingly, though I am bold enough in Christ to command you to do what is required, yet for love's sake, I prefer to appeal to you or beseech to, to, to give a little less than a command. I, Paul, an old man, and now a prisoner also for Christ Jesus, I appeal to you for my child Onesimus, whose father I became in my imprisonment. So Paul, again, likes to use such language and wants to move his readers he wants to move us uh, by the Spirit to do what God wants us to do. Notice that he appeals by the mercies of God. And here we see a theme that has been evident throughout the book of Romans. If you'll recall, in the first little bit of Romans, we have uh, really from chapter 1, verse 19, through chapter 3, down to around verse 20, uh, just this concept being driven at us that everyone's guilty and you know the Jews are guilty the Gentiles are guilty we're all guilty um, 
and then that section ends, for all are, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And then it's all about grace and mercy. And of course, the concept that goes with those, our side of it, faith, putting our trust in that grace, in that mercies. And so he's appealing to his readers right here uh, by the mercies of God. And so just a, a few passages about God's mercy. Jesus here is talking about how we should be merciful. He says, love your enemies, do good, lend, expecting nothing in return. He's just said, you know, worldly people, sinners, you know, they lend and they expect to get back in return. You know, they have this give and take that's acceptable in the world. Um, but we should do it even if we're not expecting uh, things to go well. Expecting nothing in return. And your reward will be great and you will be sons of the Most High. For he is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. How often are we tempted to not be kind to the ungrateful and the evil? But God is. Verse 36, be merciful, even as your Father is merciful. And then in 2 Corinthians 1, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Notice the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our afflictions so that we may be able to comfort those who who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. We have received. We must be willing to give. We have received comfort. We have received grace and received mercy. We must give comfort and grace and mercy to others. This is how Paul makes his appeal. And his appeal is this to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. And I do want us to notice that we are to present our bodies as a living sacrifice. Now, I believe here he is talking about the whole of who we are. So when he says present your bodies as a living sacrifice, he's using the word bodies because he's talking about sacrifice. But it's not just our physical bodies. It's our mind, our emotions, our very spiritual selves. And this kind of comes through in the last phrase in this verse, which is your spiritual worship or your spiritual service. The, it's the way you are supposed to be. If you're living by the Spirit, and he's talked a lot about the Holy Spirit in this letter already, if that's the way you're going to be, this is the way it should be manifested in your lives. You give yourself over as a sacrifice. And this is in contrast to the sacrifices that were of the Old Testament, under the old law. These sacrifices where there was death, but there was no permanence. Christ made everything complete. Christ made everything final. He was the final sacrifice where death needed to be involved. And he was willing to do it. Now we die figuratively. We die to the old self. We die to the old ways. Um, we take up our crosses daily. You know, on and on the language goes concerning how we are to live our lives putting to death all the old garbage. But we are a living sacrifice. We are alive to Christ. Submitting sacrificing on his behalf. Notice the sacrifice that we are is holy and acceptable to God. Um, and this is because of Christ. None of this is possible without Jesus and the sacrifice he made for us. In Romans 8 verse 1, we've already read in this letter that there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus we have been made clean. And so we are to present our bodies with, with an understanding of the mercies of God and an understanding that the Apostle Paul and God himself and the Spirit are appealing to us to make this happen, uh, to do this, to accept this teaching. So we present our bodies as a living sacrifice and this is holy and acceptable to God and this is the way we ought to be. 
this is the way that we spiritually serve and worship. Whatever word you uh, want uh, to, to, to apply here that, that gives you the most motivation. Obviously, we need to worship God um, at all times, and then we do need to specifically come together and worship as we are called to do. Um, and this, but the day-to-day -day worship, the day-to-day -day living for Christ, the day-to-day -day sacrifice, the taking up the cross daily, is also a part of what we are to be and a part of what we are to be doing. We must never forget. So let's go back and look at just a, a verse here about these the, the old way. Romans 6, 12 to 14. This is right after Paul has talked about our baptism and how when we are baptized into Christ, we are united with him in his death and in his resurrection. So we have come up out of the water, a transformed being, and he says, let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body. We are now slaves to righteousness, not slaves to sin, he has said. And so obviously sin shouldn't reign in our mortal body to make you obey its passions. Verse 13, do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you, since you are not under law, but under grace. And how fitting as we relate this to Romans 12, verses 1 and 2. So we do not present ourselves for sin. We do not present ourselves in a worldly way. We present our bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. All right, so verse two, do not be conformed to this world. Talk about a temptation. And I don't mean a temptation in uh, some of the other ways we're tempted. This is a temptation that's a little more sneaky. This is a way that Satan kind of uh, goes around the backside uh, to get us. We slowly move in the direction of culture. It just seems to happen. And so we need to be very, very careful and be very, very watchful of what we think about, what we say, what we allow into our minds. Sometimes we just need to turn off the TV. Sometimes we need to turn off the radio. Sometimes we need to turn off those podcasts. They will have an influence over us. And we do not want to be conformed to this world. In fact, we are told not to be. And so we must be very, very careful. Some people can handle the news and the message of this world, and they can evaluate it from a Christian standpoint. They can write books confronting it. They can do all sorts of things to help. Some, some of us are not quite that strong. Some of us, if we allow those worldly things to go into our ears day after day after day, we will start conforming to the world. We will start being like the world. We will start fighting for the things that the world wants. Can you imagine? There should be such a separation between us and the world. I like the phrase, of course, that we should be in the world, but not of the world. We need to be in the world because we need to influence the world. We need to be trying to change people's hearts. But we must never allow ourselves to feel at home in this place. We do not want to be conformed to this world. Galatians 1, 3 through 5 says, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to deliver us from the present evil age according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be the glory forever. Amen. We've noted before that Paul just sometimes cannot help himself in giving a moment of praise to God, especially when he talks about evil things. And here, the present evil age. Christ gave himself up to deliver us from this, to keep us from this for us to conform ourselves back into what our culture is doing and what our culture is saying is, is quite insulting, I'm sure, to the Father, Son, and I'm sure it grieves the Holy Spirit. And then in Ephesians 2, verses 1 through 3, 
and you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air and the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. So notice these three verses. This is how we were, past tense. If we start conforming to the world, we drift back into walking in the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air. None of us want to get up to the judgment and have God say, you know, you were following the prince of the power of the air. I mean, we would be appalled and we do not want to conform to this world. But notice the next few verses, and this leads into the next part of Romans chapter 12, verse 2. But, so that's where we were, but God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, and following the course of the world, and following the prince of the power of the air, even when that was happening, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. A little sub-theme tonight, obviously, is this kindness of God. Kindness toward those who are ungrateful. Kindness toward those who are weak. Here, kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. So we are not to be conformed to this world, but rather we are to be transformed by the renewal of our minds. The verse says, of your mind. That by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. A note about this testing. This testing here um, is is the idea of living it out and finding out that it is true. So this is not a test like uh, a, a pen and paper test or a Scantron test for those of us who know what that is. Uh, this is not that kind of thing. It's not a multiple choice. It's not a true false. It's not even an essay. It is living out, testing the truths of God and finding out, you know what? Yeah, these things are good and acceptable and perfect. These things are true. This is the way things are and should be. So we live it out. We live out the transformation. We live out separating ourselves from the world, not conforming to the world. This is how we test this transformation. This is how we test uh, this renewal of the mind. We do want to make sure that our minds are being changed. And I like all the passages in scripture that talk about the mind. I like the passages that talk about what we are to think about, what we are to, to do, but particularly these thinking passages. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. Titus 3, 4 through 7 says, But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, he saved us not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. So baptism, receiving the Holy Spirit, and of course this renewal of the Holy Spirit doesn't end at baptism. The Holy Spirit continues to transform us, continues to sanctify us as we live out our Christian lives. He continues to help us and will right to the end. And 1 Peter 2, 2 and 3, like newborn infants long for the pure spiritual milk that by it you may grow up into salvation if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. Again, this testing is a living it out. This testing is a, an experiment. It's a testing where we live it out and we find out, yes, this is true. And Peter here is pointing out, we have tasted that the Lord is good. We have experienced 
the greatness and the goodness and the kindness and the mercy and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Transformed by the renewal of your mind. One final passage on this. The natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him, and he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. The spiritual person, on the other hand, judges all things, but is himself to be judged by no one. For who has understood the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. Talk about a lofty goal. Talk about a place that we want to be and, and struggle to get to. We are so influenced by the things around us. But we need to be moving in the direction of thinking like Jesus. And notice here, Paul, you know, these Corinthians, we sure wouldn't look at them and say, hey, those Christians had it all pulled together. They knew exactly what they were doing. But he still said to them, we have the mind of Christ. When we are baptized into Christ, when we are initially transformed, there is a real change that takes place. And we receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. He lives in us from that point forward. And it does change us. Now we continue to grow. We continue to have more faith. We continue to be we continue in this transformation, we continue in this sanctification, but there is a real sense where Paul can write and we can know and we can believe that we do have the mind of Christ. Now, it does not mean that we are eternal, that we're omniscient, that we're anything that has to do with God's qualities, but we already think like Jesus. Let's not resist that. Let's allow that to be our standard operating procedure. Let's allow that to be the norm for us. That's what we want. So Romans 12, 1 and 2, read once again in its entirety, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. And we will pick up there uh, next week. Let me glance to the side here at my outline. We will do verses 3 through 13 of chapter 12. Think with sober judgment. So uh, that's our next section. Uh, hopefully you can read that ahead of time and, and get a little prepped for that. Uh, but that's what we'll look at. May the Lord continue to bless you and keep you.